Hi everyone, welcome back to Art of the Part. In this video, we're going to continue on with our fidget spinner case study. And you can see here on the screen, we have the assembly that we're looking at in SOLIDWORKS now opened up in MasterCam. So that's going to include that three-spoke spinner sitting on top of that soft riser, which will need to hold the part either off the table or between two square vices. Now, before we go ahead and get started here into the simultaneous five-axis programming, it's important for us to consider what components are going to be active while that table is swiveling and rotating. And I want to be able to see that here in MasterCam and especially verify so I can prevent any crashes or collisions. So even though we have an assembly here opened inside of MasterCam, we can merge in additional components or additional assemblies using the file merge command. And I'm going to show you how to do that using our five axis vice and riser assembly. So let's go ahead and get started. So in the bottom left hand corner here, we're going to look for our levels tab. And inside of levels, we're going to add a new level for our five axis vice and riser assembly. So we're going to look for that green plus button in the top left hand corner and we're going to select that to add new level. And we're going to name that vice and riser. So you'll notice that there are zero entities currently active on that level. However, in the next step, when we go file merge and we bring in all those components, there's going to be about eight or nine different entities on that one level. So just make sure that we have a check mark next to vice and riser and then we'll be able to move into the next step, which is to go to file. And then in file, we're going to look for merge. And then we're going to find our five axis vice and riser assembly. Now, this is probably going to default to native MasterCAM files. So if you're not seeing your SOLIDWORKS assembly, go ahead and hit the drop down menu and look for all files. And then we'll select five axis vice and riser. And then we'll select open. Now, we're probably going to have to do a little bit of back and forth here. Uh, we're going to select the active configuration, which is going to be the hard jaws with the parallels. Hit the green check mark. But I don't want this to drop on a number of different levels. I want it to drop on the level that we just created. So select active levels. And then that's going to bring up this configuration box again, and we're going to choose hard jaws with parallels and hit the green check mark. So this is going to be a little bit awkward. We've actually lost our part inside of the assembly that we just brought in. So I'm going to have to move it down in line with the riser. So we're going to use this dynamic command here on the left hand side. So I'm going to click on dynamic and I want the part to sit on top of this parallel. So we're going to use one of these corners on the parallel to move it down in Y to line it up with the part. So click on one of these corners here and then we'll select on the Y axis and then we're going to drag this down. And you'll see that if I start to hover over pieces of geometry, it's actually going to snap in line with that uh, specific uh, coincidence. So here on the bottom level of our riser, I want it to sit on top of the parallel. So I'm going to click on that bottom corner there. And that just moved it down in Y, or in this instance Z, when we uh, rotate our planes around uh, in line with that parallel. So I'll hit the green check mark. And I'll hit the green check mark once again to get out of this merge pattern. And you'll see that it dropped all of those components here on that vice and riser. I don't know why it made all these additional uh, levels here, but I'm just going to select them and I'm going to delete the, or sorry, clear the empty levels. So now that I've brought in my assembly, I actually want to be able to move some of these components independently because if I rotate my part, you can see that the riser itself is floating in midair. And I want this to sit on top of this parallel as well as clamp down my vise. So we're going to use that dynamic command again. However, it's going to be located in a different tab. So up here in this top toolbar, we're going to look for transform and inside of transform, we're going to look for dynamic. So when we click on dynamic, we'll be able to select individual components, which will include this parallel, this vice, and then this slider. So let's click on those three and we'll see them turn yellow and I'll be able to uh, select end selection. Now what this is going to do is I'm going to be able to choose on some of these corners or edges and pull them in line with this back edge there, just like what we did before. So if I want to, I can try to fish for this edge here, or you can use the back edge of the parallel, but I'll just use that corner right there and I'll click on the Z and then I can dra uh, drag this in line with this back edge of my uh, riser. And there you can see now it's sitting on top of that parallel. And then I'll hit the green check mark. And we'll do the same thing here to the other side. So using that dynamic command inside of transform, I'll select on the parallel, the vice, and then the slider. And I'll select end selection. And once again, we can either grab this corner here or I can grab the back corner of the parallel. So I'll just grab that corner right there. And I'll select on the Z slider and then I will 
sli uh, select the corner or one of these edges here of the front side of the riser. And then I'll hit the green check mark. And if this is a little bit annoying for you where this side is the color it's supposed to be and all these other selections are purple, well, you can hop over here to the Home tab, and inside of Home, there should be a little stack of colors next to a stack of no colors, and that's called Clear Colors, and then we'll be able to clear the colors just like that. So now that I have all the components that I need for my work holding assembly, let's go ahead and set up a new top plane in Mastercam since this is coming from SOLIDWORKS. So if you remember, and if I right click here in the free space and I click on top, well, I'm actually looking at the front view. I need to rotate this around so I'm looking down at the top view while I'm programming. So what we're going to need to do is go down here in the bottom left hand corner and select on our planes tab. And I'm going to rotate my part and zoom in on this top edge so it's easier for me to click on some of these lines. But uh, inside the planes tab, I'm going to find my green plus button. I'm going to click on that and in that drop down menu, I'm going to select dynamic. And this is why I wanted to zoom in and get up close and personal with it because there's so many little edges here that I might accidentally click and set my top plane off. So we're going to try to find that top edge of the uh, chamfer here. And it's a diameter, so when I click on it, Mastercam is recognizing that there's a center point to it. And what I'm going to try to do is rotate around an X so that Z is facing up. So using one of these red segments here, I'm going to click on them and then rotate negative 90 degrees inside the compass so that Z is actually facing up. And I can rename this plane to first op top. And if you wanted to, you could set your WCS, T, and C planes here. However, I'm just going to hit the green check mark and I'll set my WCS, uh, C, and T planes outside. So I'm going to click on WCS here, C, and T. And then if I right click and I click on top, now I'm looking down at the uh, top of the part. So now that we've established our first operation top plane, I would feel comfortable adding machine, then bringing in our tool library, as well as setting up some stock materials and fixtures. So let's go over to the bottom left and inside the toolpaths tab, it's currently empty, but when I add a machine, I wanna see it get populated. So in the top toolbar here, I'm gonna to go to machine and inside machine, I'm gonna click on mill and then I'm gonna grab a default mill. So you can see it get populated here, and then it's just a good habit while we're in this page to just set up our tool manager or tool library. So here where it says tool manager, I'm going to click on that icon, and then uh, my tool library is currently empty, and so is my magazine. So I'm going to use this uh, file open to select a new tool library. I'll click on that. I'm going to find my DMU50 tool library. You can see that my library is right there. If I highlight everything and then click on the arrow up, it's going to copy it into my magazine and I should be able to hit the green check mark. So now that when I go forward and uh, start making toolpath, I'm going to be pulling from those tools. So let's go ahead and set up our stock material as well as our fixtures next. So in the left hand side in our operations manager, we should see machine group one and properties. Well, I'm going to expand out my properties and click on the stock setup icon. Now, we've done this a number of times where we've just added from a bounding box, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. However, I'm going to deviate and actually talk about how to set up your fixtures first. So on the left-hand side, we should see these icons, and if I hover over them long enough, they'll expand out, and I should be able to toggle between these different tabs. I'm going to select the Work Holding tab, and I'm going to turn on my fixtures. So I can now populate this window with components or entities inside of my workspace. So I can click on this pointer button and select uh, entities or components manually. However, we've already separated these out by levels. So I'm going to choose add from level, uh, which is the stack of three papers there. I'll click on that icon and now I can choose from these levels that we currently have active. So for example, we brought in that five axis vice and riser. I'm going to select that. I'm also going to hold down the control key on my keyboard and I'm going to select on the soft riser A1, which is that component that's sitting on top of the parallels. And I'll hit the green check mark. So I'm telling Mastercam what are my fixtures so that when it pulls it into verify, uh, it can separate out the stock material from what is not supposed to be cut, which is going to be our fixtures here. So let's go ahead and hop back over here to our stock setup tab. I'll go one tab up and let's use the stock plane transformation now and I'll uh, expand that out and instead of it pulling from the current top plane, I'm going to hit the drop down menu and pull from the uh, first operation top that we just set up. So I'll click on first op top 
And now let's go ahead and do a normal bounding box like we've done before. So I'll click on add from bounding box. And this is gonna default here to a rectangle and we'll be able to quickly change this, but I'm gonna rotate it and zoom in. I'm gonna have to use my uh, mouse pointer here, click on that to get manual, select on this component and selection. And like I said, it's gonna default out here to a rectangle. However, we can change that to a cylinder and it's gonna be a little bit awkward, but we'll have to rotate this around in Z so that it's the full diameter of the part. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna change the radius since it's pulling from the finished part to 1.5, which is going to be our stock material. And the height we can leave the same because we said we were pulling this from a finished disc, either from the lathe or the mill. And then I'll hit the green check mark. And I'll hit the green check mark once again so it applies all the changes that I just made for my stock as well as my fixtures. So I'll hit the green check mark and it'll bring me back to here. Now, if we wanna be able to see that stock material that we just created, understand that it's off by default. However, if we're here in our toolpaths tab, there's a section called stock and I can display that stock either on or off by clicking on the stock display. So once I click on stock display, you can actually see the outlines or the extents in red. And speaking of our stock, I also wanna create a level with wireframe uh, that is going to match up to this stock here so I can pull from it and use it while programming my toolpaths. So in the bottom left hand corner here, I'm gonna select our levels tab and inside our levels tab, I'm gonna create a new level and I'm gonna title that wireframe. And again, you'll notice that there are no entities currently active on our wireframe level, but I just wanna make sure that there is a check mark next to the wireframe before we move into the next step. So I'm gonna come up here into my toolbar here and I'm gonna click on wireframe and just like what we did for our stock material, I'm gonna create a bounding box around our fidget spinner. So I'm gonna click, uh, select on bounding box. I'm gonna select the uh, fidget spinner itself and hit end selection. So it's gonna default here to a rectangle. However, I'm gonna uh, change it over here to a cylinder like we did before. And once again, we'll have to rotate it here in Z. And then I'm gonna change my uh, outer diameter or the radius here to 1.5 hit the green check mark, and now I have a stock as well as a wireframe at that three inch diameter. So now that we've established our stock, I actually wanna spend some time here and talk about our fixtures because they're a bit more complicated than just setting up some wireframe geometry. So let's go back here to the toolpaths tab and inside of toolpaths, there's an option right next to verify called simulator options. And when we click on this, it's actually not going to let us access this unless we have toolpath in our operations manager. So I'm gonna click on the okay, and I'm going to now program my first piece of geometry, and then we'll come back in here and we'll talk about that uh, simulator options. So let's go ahead and create our first toolpath, which is going to be a roughing operation to mill away the extents or the profile of this fidget spinner using 2D dynamic mill. Now hop over here to the toolpaths tab and inside of toolpaths, we're gonna pick from the 2D gallery. We can either expand it or pick from that top toolbar there, but we're gonna try to find that dynamic mill. So I'll click on dynamic mill and this is why it's important for us to create that wireframe geometry. So I wanna establish an area of where our tool is going to operate. So inside of the machining regions, I'm gonna select that pointer and then just make sure that you're pulling from wireframe and then I'm gonna select the top edge of the wireframe that we just created, so that outer diameter there. I'll click on that and I'll hit the green check mark. Now we have to choose our machining strategy. Are we gonna stay within that diameter or can we approach it from the outside? And I'm gonna say, let's go ahead and approach from the outside because there's nothing that we really have to worry about um, as we're approaching this shape. So I'm gonna choose from outside. And then lastly, we're gonna use the avoidance region to establish the fidget spinner as a point or reference that we can't cross over. So I'm gonna click on avoidance region and we'll have to toggle back over here to solids and we will not be able to take advantage of any of these loops or these faces. However, if I change this over to edges and I turn off my face and I hold down the shift key and I select one of these uh, lower edges here, which is going to be the full profile. And while holding down the shift key, I'm gonna select this. You'll notice that it'll actually pick up the entire loop. So I'll hit the green check mark and that'll be our avoidance geometry so the tool can't cross over into the part. Now we'll hit the green check mark and we've established all of our extents. 
So let's go ahead and look at some of these different uh, parameters here in our uh, tool. So I'm going to come down here to tool and it's a pretty large area you can see here in the background here. Um, so I'm going to use a bigger tool. I'm going to rough this out with our 5 8 end mill rougher. So I'm going to do 0.625 end mill and then I'm going to put a note here for rough. And then we'll come down here to the stock parameters. Uh, we're going to leave about five thousandths here on the wall. However, we're going to leave nothing there on the floor. And then we're going to come down here to the uh, linking parameters. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about this. So right now, the way that this part is assembled, there's actually a gap between the surface or the top face of the riser and then the bottom uh, face of the uh, fidget spinner. And we did that on purpose because I want to be able to cut this entire operation from the first operation or the top side so I don't have to flip it over to the other side and try to blend it. Um, so I'm going to set up some depths here. So just make sure here in the linking parameters we have absolute, 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 and absolute. Top of stock is going to be zero because that's that surface that was coming off the turned lathe. Uh, but the depths, again, we just want to make sure that we're not going into the riser, but I am going to show you a bad example on how we can set up our fixtures and collision recognition. So I'm going to do this on purpose. So if you click on the depth, and we click on this bottom edge here, we see that there's a depth value of negative 0.28125. Now if I go and click on depth again, and I click on this top face of the riser, we see that that value is negative 0.34375. I'm going to go a little bit below that. So I'm actually going to choose uh, to make the tool go down into the riser, but in reality, I actually want the tool to kind of hover here in that uh, gap. So I'm going to go a little bit lower. I'm going to change this to negative 0.375, and I'm going to uh, hit the green check mark. And you can see that the toolpath geometry is generating just how I want it to. However, it's actually intersecting here with the riser itself. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like and verify. And I'm going to go over here to the left-hand side in my operations manager, and I'm going to go and find this icon at the top for verify operations. So I'm going to click on verify. And you're going to see here, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, that when I play this, the toolpath looks pretty good. So there's no complaints there. However, there's still geometry that's underneath it that includes the fixtures. And I still have my fixtures on, but I'm not seeing them. So what I have to do is I'm going to back out of this verify, close that window, and remember that icon that we were looking at, that simulator options earlier? Well, I couldn't access it because there weren't any toolpaths in the operation manager. Well, we just created a toolpath, so when I click on this, it should allow us or open up this window. So I'm going to turn on fixtures now. So I'm going to click on fixtures. And I just have to associate the levels that are linked to that fixture so Verify knows what it's pulling from. So I'm going to turn on our vice and riser as well as our soft riser. And I'll hit the green check mark. So now when I go back into Verify, I'll click on the Verify icon once again. Look at that. We can now see the fixture in green as well as the stock material here in red. So let's play this out and see what happens. While it's a little bit better and we can actually visualize and see where this is going to collide, I still want a warning from Mastercam to tell me that, hey, there's going to be a collision or a crash when this tool hits that fixture. So there's one last parameter that we need to set up. So in this top toolbar here, I'm going to go into Verify, and we're going to find this icon that says Collision Checking, and underneath Collision Checking, there's a little arrow to open up an additional window. And inside of this window, I want to turn on Tool versus Fixture. So I'll click on Tool versus Fixture, and I'll click on OK. So if I rewind this again and let it play out, let's see what happens. Hey, that's what I'm looking for. We want to see that Tool stop and give me a warning. So if I come down here to the bottom right, there's actually going to be a report to say that the Tool is going to hit the Fixture. So that's an incredibly powerful resource for us to have as we start to move into simultaneous 5-axis programming. So let's go ahead and back out of the Verify and update the linking parameters so we don't hit the fixture. So inside of this 2D dynamic mill, I'm going to go here into the parameters, and we have a total depth here of negative 0.375. Um, we don't want to go into that fixture anymore, so I actually want the tool to glide in between the bottom surface of the fidget spinner and then the top surface of the riser or the fixture. So we had a value, and we can check this again. I can go to the bottom of that that's negative 0.218, 
and then we want to go below that but above 0.34375 so I'm going to split the difference and I'm going to say negative 0.3125 and then hit the green check mark so you can see that the tool is now going to glide in between those two surfaces and we should be good to go so I'm going to go ahead and play that through the verify once again to make sure that there are no collisions and see if my uh, collision detection is actually running the way that I want to so let's go ahead and play that and you can see here in the reports it didn't stop as well as there are no errors here for the collisions so I'm gonna say that's pretty good as we start to move into these other tool paths so let's go ahead and clean up that 5000 wall that we left over with the 2d dynamic mill and we're gonna use a contour mill and we're just going to cut around the outside edge and just do one single pass so that's here in that 2D gallery. We can expand it if we can't find it, but it's gonna be the first position here in my toolbar. And I'm going to utilize the same technique that I did when I was doing the 2D dynamic mill where I'm pulling from a solid and I'm using the edge. And I'm gonna to try to force this tool path into creating a climb cut rather than a conventional cut. So hold down the shift key, make sure your edge is selected, and I'm gonna grab one of these uh, corner radii. And the arrow is going the way that I want for climb cutting, and I'm going to hit the green check mark. So let's pick a tool. Uh, one thing to mention, if you have multiple spokes, say you have like a 10 spoke design, you might not be able to utilize the 5 8 finish end mill that we're going to use here. Uh, so maybe just step the tool down a little bit. For, but for our instance, we have a big pocket and an area of access. So I'm just going to do a 5 8 end mill finish, 0.625 end mill. And then I'm gonna put a note after there for finish. Cut parameters, everything looks good. There's nothing on the walls, nothing on the floors. Uh, we're gonna come down here to linking parameters. Um, we're just gonna change this all to absolute, 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 and absolute. Top of stock, we're gonna leave that at zero. And then the depth, we're gonna choose the same value that we did before with a negative 0.3125. And I'm going to hit the enter key. All right, so it looks like we got a good lead and lead out. I'm gonna have this simulate and I will see how this looks. Zoom out a little bit and then we'll let that play out. Okay, no collisions. I'm gonna change my color loop here so that I can see the colors. So if you come up here and verify, click on verify and then you can toggle your color loop on or off to see what tool or what operation that we're using. So I'm gonna back out of Verify here, and I'm feeling pretty good with where we're at. We've already completed the roughing and the finishing of the outside profile for the fidget spinner, so I think we can go ahead and access this chamfer, which is going to be a swarf or a five-axis toolpath. So this is going to be our first entry into simultaneous five-axis toolpath. And I don't really wanna see all these toolpaths right now, so I'm gonna select my toolpath group one and just toggle them off. Uh, just because I want to see how that next toolpath in the multi-axis looks like. So here in the toolpaths tab, we're going to find a section for multi-axis. And inside of multi-axis, we're going to expand out this gallery, and we're going to look for a toolpath called Swarf. So I'll click on Swarf, and we already have the 5 8 end mill finisher out, so I'm going to scroll up and see if I can use that tool again. So I'll click on the 5 8 finisher, do 0.625, end mill and then I'll put a note here for swarf. We don't really have to worry about stock. We can come down here to cut parameters and we're gonna have to set up a few um, chains here. So here inside of walls where it says surface, I'm gonna click on this pointer here. And just like what we did before where we're trying to grab loops of edges, I'm gonna hold down the shift key and I'm gonna click on one of these chamfer edges. And you'll notice that it's going to pick up all the tangent edges that are aligned with that chamfer. And I'll hit the end selection. And you just want to follow along with the notes that this toolpath is giving you. So it says, hey, select the first surface. So I'm going to zoom in here and I'm going to say this tip here is going to be our first surface. And then select the first lower rail. So you just want to move your mouse down until you hit this bottom edge. Be careful that you don't accidentally try to pull it in the corner because it might try to go perpendicular. So I'm just going to grab anywhere here on this bottom edge. And then you can see that I have a green arrow going this way, which would be conventional milling. I want this to cut climb, so I'm going to choose to reverse the direction. And I'm going to hit the green check mark. So I've got my chain set up. The cutting method is going to be one way. Compensation is for the computer. 
This is all looking good. If I wanted to try to tighten up some of my uh, Swarf toolpath, it's gonna try to break this into a, a bunch of GO1, GO2, and GO3 commands. So I'm gonna try to make it a little bit finer and improve the quality here. So the distance and where it's following, you can see how it's like breaking that up. I'm actually gonna change this to 0 0.002. And it recommends that it's usually double this value of this cut tolerance. So if I tried to go smaller or equal, it says cut tolerance is less than half the step distance is recommended. So just try to make it double whatever this value is, so 0 0.002. And then we're going to go down to uh, tool axis control. We're going to do output format. Just make sure that it's reading as five axis. Our back plot here, uh, we're going to use the Z axis as our rotary because it's going to rotate around that Z axis. And then down here in collision control, everything looks good, but we do want to change this lower rail here. So I'm going to click on that lower rail and I'm going to force the tool to go a little bit below that lower rail that we just established. So I'm going to go in negative because I want to go below that lower rail. I'm going to say negative 0 0.015625. So I'm going 15 thousandths below the surface of that uh, rail that we set up. Linking is all good. Roughing is good. Filter. And we can go ahead and hit the green check mark. And we're going to see how this toolpath looks. So it's generating. And we see that it's actually projecting the contour of that just offset up a little bit. So let's see how this looks when I verify this one toolpath on its own. So I'll go to verify. And let's see how it plays out. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and I'm going to let this play. And we'll be able to see the tool move around the edge of this part. So that's going to be the chamfer with constant contact to that face, which is why we use that swarf command. And we can see this a little bit better if we want to go into the simulation. So from verify, we'll go to simulation. And that's going to bring in the rotary table as well as the rest of the machine. And we'll be able to see this whole assembly rotate as well as the tool move up and down and left and right and X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to let this play out. And you can see how much uh, is going into this simultaneous tool path to complete that one edge. However, there's one last thing that I want to check out here before we exit out of verify. So go back into the verify here. And I'm going to pull my tool path back to uh, this point, which is going to be like at the bottom edge of the uh, pocket there. So I'm going to pull this back. I'm going to stop it right there. So just looking at this, there's something else that we need to consider. And it's an additional part of the work holding assembly, which is going to be that socket head cap screw. So I'm going to have to add that back into this assembly and then check that verify to see how close I am to it. So I'm going to back out of here really quick. And then I'm going to access that simulator options we were looking at earlier when we were setting up our fixtures. So I'm going to click on that icon and it's going to open up this window and we just want to include that socket head screw with the fixtures. So I'm going to click on that level for four and then hit the green check mark. I'm also going to select all of my tool paths here. So it's going to be the dynamic mill, the contour, and then the swarf, and then let them all play out here and verify. So I'll click on verify. I was worried there for a second, but it looks like the uh, cap screw was just hidden behind the tool. And I'm gonna let this play. So I'm gonna slow it down just a little bit and then let it play out. Okay, so this is where I wanna see how this looks. So I'm gonna back it up a little bit. And you can see how close we truly are to that socket head cap screw. However, we are not colliding with it because the uh, collision report would stop and show up. So this is still good. We just might want to use a shorter cap screw uh, in the future. Um, changing the tool really isn't going to matter here because it's all dependent on the angle and how this face touches that angle. So even if we go to a smaller tool, we're still going to have the same distance here. But I'm going to let it continue to play, speed it up. And that all looks pretty good to me. So once again, I'm gonna back out of here of uh, Verify. And I'm gonna start looking at the rest of these features to try and finish this up. So we've already roughed and finished this outside profile as well as broke the edge with a simultaneous five axis swarf. And now I'm gonna start looking at these two holes as well as the rest of these uh, ball mill details. So I'm gonna start off looking at the holes first and 
I'm gonna analyze what size they are to see what tool I can use. So jump over here to the Home tab, and inside of Home, we're gonna use the Analyze Entity. And I'm gonna measure that uh, diameter to see what it is, and I'm getting a value of 0.25. So I know I have a 0.25 drill, as well as a 0.25 uh, end mill. However, I don't want to accidentally make it too small or too big, especially using a drill. I wanna do a true helix down to try and maintain that uh, pocket or that uh, hole so that if I rotate this or flip it around, it's gonna line up with this locating pin. So I'm actually going to drill with a smaller drill and then clean it up using a helix mill. So come over here to tool paths, and then I'm going to use the uh, drill. So if you open up your expand gallery for the 2D, we can either find drill somewhere down here, or maybe it's in the top row, but I'm gonna grab drill. I'm gonna grab these two uh, diameters here. So they're both registering as 0.25. I'm gonna hit the green check mark, and then inside a tool, I'm actually gonna choose a smaller drill. So I'm gonna come down here to my 213 drill, which is just a step smaller than my 250. And I'm going to title this 0.213 drill, and then we'll just put clean up. And then I'm going to come down here to cut parameters. This all looks good, and we're just gonna do a straight drill. And then we're gonna come down here to linking parameters and we'll just change this to absolute, absolute, and absolute. Top, uh, top of stock, we're gonna change that to zero or update it to zero. And the depth, we're just gonna go down here to the bottom edge of our part. And that's gonna be that 0.21825. And let's see if we can use that value that we were using before as the negative 0.3125. However, we have to consider the tip of the drill uh, because we want it to break through the bottom side of the part. So I'm gonna turn on tip compensation. So I'll turn tip comp on. And the breakthrough amount, I'm just gonna make it 0 0.015. And the tip angle, we just have to update this to 140 degrees, because we just have a, a little bit more obtuse tip angles on our drills. And I'll hit the green check mark. So I can see that, but ooh, look at that. It's actually cutting into our uh, riser there. Let's see if it's actually going to recognize that with the collision detection. So I'm gonna select all these toolpaths and uh, run this and verify. Okay, and I'm gonna hit the play button. There's the swarf. And look at that. It actually stopped because it was going to collide with the fixture there. So we're gonna to have to adjust that depth a little bit. So I'm gonna back out of verify here again. And then I'm gonna go into the parameters of our drill that we just made. And inside of linking parameters, I'm just gonna update that depth from negative 0.3125. I'm just gonna go a little bit less and just go to negative 0.25 and see how that looks. And I'll hit the green check mark and I can kind of look under here and it looks like I have enough clearance now. So let's select all of our toolpaths again, get that whole toolpath group and then let it run and verify and see if we get that error once again. So I'll play this out. We're seeing the swarf. And it looks like both those drills plunged without hitting the fixture because I would have re, uh, gotten some kind of uh, collision report here. So again, we're gonna back out of verify and then we're gonna start looking at the circle mill for both of these holes. So the circle mill is actually located here in the 2D gallery. So if you expand this out, it's on the same line as drill, but it's here at the end. So I'm gonna click on circle mill and it's gonna operate a lot like the drill feature where we select the holes and it's gonna tell us what diameter they are. So we see a value here of 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and I'll hit the green check mark. All right, so I'm gonna hop down here to tools and we're gonna use a little bit smaller of a tool which is going to be our 1 8 end mill. And I'm just going to type in 0 0.125 end mill and I'm gonna put a finish after it. And all we're doing is we're just gonna helical down and just take like one or two passes on that outside edge. So we're gonna come down here to cut parameters and this is actually a pretty cool feature. So if we drill something, it's just gonna be that hole size. However, if you looked at our blueprint, it actually had a tolerance on these holes for plus one thousandths minus zero thousandths. And that's because it has to fit here inside of that uh, locating pin. So I'm actually gonna make this just a little bit oversized so that when we flip it over for second operation, we can locate it. So I'll click on override geometry. I'm gonna change the uh, circle diameter here to 0.251. And 
And then the stock to leave on walls is going to be zero. Stock to leave on floors is zero. Now, I actually like the roughing approach here in the circle mill. So if I turn this on, it allows me to do a helical entry. And I'm just going to change the Z clearance. So instead of it being like 100 thousandths above the part, I'm actually just going to go to about 30 thousandths above the part. Really don't have to worry about anything else here. I just have to go inside of linking parameters and just make sure that this is reading absolute, 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 and absolute. Top of stock is still registering as zero. And then the depth, we're just gonna go again, we're gonna break through a little bit, go to this edge. We can just type in negative 0.3125 and then hit the green check mark. So you can see that it's gonna helical all the way down and then it's just gonna take one pass here. So I'm gonna simulate that out, verify it let it play. Okay, zoom out a little bit and then let it play. And I'll speed this up so it can get to that point. All right, and then I'm gonna pull it back just a little bit, but you can see as it's approaching this hole here, it's just going to, I'm gonna slow it down, helical down, and it's gonna take one or two passes, come back out, same thing here. It's gonna helical down take one or two passes and then come right out. And then I'm gonna back out of here out of verify. So now I'm gonna take a look at these ball milled surfaces, which are just gonna be giant edge breaks. I'm gonna take a tool, which is just gonna be a ball mill, and I'm gonna come around, spiral down, and then clean up the edge and then come right out. So we're going to go into the 3D tool path and then I'm going to expand this and I'm gonna to try to find my flow line tool path. So I'm gonna click on flow line and we can try to approach this the same way that we did with the looping and the linking that we did in the other entities. However, there's gonna be a problem with this, but I'll, I'll show you how it's gonna uh, shake out here. So I'm gonna hold down the control key, I'm gonna hold down the shift key, and I'm gonna select this one surface, and it's gonna grab all three of these. Now, that looks good, but when I hit end selection, you'll notice that the number of surfaces that it picked up were actually six. So that's actually gonna include all of those surfaces there on the other side because we mirrored them over. So I'm gonna click these one by one. So I'm gonna reselect them, clear the selection, and then I'm going to click these three one by one and then click end selection. So I only should see three there for that top surface. Now the flow line approach, we're just gonna click on this little icon. And right now it's just giving us not the greatest approach. It's gonna like come closer to the center and go almost like a clock where it's gonna go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. We wanna change that direction just a little bit. So inside of this flow line data window, we're just gonna change the cut direction so that it approaches from a spiral. So I'm gonna zoom in on that. Uh, it's gonna be easier to see on this top one here. So again, this is kinda like the clock where it's coming up and down, up and down, up and down. But if we change the cut direction to the spiral, it's actually gonna spiral all the way down here and then I'll hit the green check mark. And then I'll hit the green check mark once again. I'm gonna have to choose the tool here. I know that it's got a 0.1875 uh, radius. So I'm gonna find my 375 uh, ball end mill. So that's gonna be right there. So I'm gonna title this 0.375 ball end mill. And then in my surface parameter, Really don't have to change too much here. If I wanted to, I could try to retract it a little bit more to clear the uh, socket head cap screw. So maybe I'll just make that one. Not really a big deal, but over here in flow line uh, parameters, we're gonna change the cutting method here to one way or spiral. Either one's gonna work, but I'll just do the spiral there. And we're gonna try to improve some of these tolerances here in just a second, but I'm gonna show you what this looks like and how to improve it. So I'll hit the green check mark. And you can see the tool path is coming around uh, to each one of these spokes. And I will verify that out. Now, I'm only gonna select my last tool path, which is gonna be that flow line. And I'm going to select on verify, and I'll slow it down a little bit so we can see how that tool moves. So I'm going to try to show that spiral here. I'll hit the play button. Yeah, you can see that. It's spiraling down and it's just kind of like doing a helix and it's going to the bottom surface and then it's moving to the next pocket, so on and so forth. However, this is just a little bit too polygonal for my taste. I might want to try to increase the surface finish so that this is one solid arc or one solid diameter. So let's back out. And yeah, you can see that there in the toolpath too, the blue line there. Uh, it's just going from like straight edge to straight edge to straight edge, or it might be just like one giant arc. 
So if we come here to our finished flow line and we open up the parameters here and inside of that flow lines parameter tab, we're gonna click on total tolerance. And inside of total tolerance, we just wanna turn on our, light, our line arc filtering and make sure that it's processing X and Y and G17. And then we're just going to increase our cut tolerance here. We're just gonna take this slider and we're just slide it all the way up and then hit the green check mark. So just take a look at what this arc looks like right now or this whole profile there and I'll hit the green check mark and green check mark again and look at that it really tightened it up and made it one solid circle or one solid diameter so I'm gonna go ahead and play that out again and I'll just speed through it to see what it looks like as the final surface finish yeah look at that look how much nicer that edge is what it was before which was just a bunch of broken up lines so let's go ahead and back out and just repeat the same function here for that top uh, ball mill. Now let's hop over here to the 3D gallery, expand it out again, and we're going to find that flow line. So we'll click on flow line, and we're just going to manually select these uh, smaller ball mill surfaces, which are going to be for that uh, 0 0.0625 radius or 1 8 ball mill. And we don't want to accidentally select all those surfaces underneath. That's why I'm not grabbing them as a loop, but I'm going to hit end selection. So inside a drive, which should see those three surfaces, and then the flow line should still remember what we did in the last operation. So I'm going to click on flow line. It looks like it's still picking up those spirals. Everything seems to be good. I'm going to hit the green check mark, green check mark. And then we're going to use the 1 8 ball mill instead of the 3 8 ball mill because the radius is 0 0.0625, not 0 0.1875. So we'll click on 0.125 ball mill. I'll just give a note here for my 0.125 ball mill. And then we're going to hop over here to surface parameters. It seemed like that one inch retract was working for us. And then we're going to use the finish flow line parameters and then check the total tolerance. It's still picking up the same settings as last time. So green check mark, green check mark, pretty painless, not too bad. And I'm going to go ahead and simulate all these features together. So go to the uh, top of the toolpath group one here, select that. So all of them are selected. Might as well turn on our tool paths to see how they look. And that's that little wave that we can toggle on or off. And then I'm going to select on verify. And we'll slow this down a little bit to see how it plays out. And I'll let it play here. So we did that 2D dynamic roughing operation. We left about five thousandths there on the wall. And then we came back and we just did a finishing operation with a contour. And then you can see here we're using that same tool to do the swarf. So we're just falling around that top edge. It's gonna be at a 30 degree angle and we're just gonna have constant contact with the surface of the tool as well uh, with the uh, chamfer that we created. So as it comes around, we're still getting that clearance there from the uh, socket head bolt. We might wanna tell the operator that maybe to use a smaller profile, but you can see here clearly that there's gonna be no collisions and we would see a collision report there and this is probably going to just snap through this really quickly. So I'm going to slow it down and just bring it forward uh, so we can try to see what these uh, tool paths look like. So again, we're just going to have two drills come in here and we're just going to kind of clear some of that material out so we don't have to put a lot of stress on that 1 8 ball mill. And you can see it's going to just clean up that small edge. Maybe I can catch it on this side. It's really only taken about you know, like 15 thousandths off, and then it's going to do one final pass down there at the bottom. And then we're going to do that flow line with that 3 8 ball mill. And the only reason that we're not seeing a hole there is because it was already included with the uh, fidget spinner blank. So we didn't need to redrill it. Plus, that's where the locating pin is, and we don't want to crash into that locating pin. So I think we're in a pretty good position to just flip this around now for second operation and start programming that other side. So I'm going to back out of verify. And you can see here that we did a lot in this video. We talked about setting up fixtures and how to control our tool, especially when we're doing uh, simultaneous five axis programming. And it's just a good habit to set this up beforehand so that you don't accidentally crash into a fixture or a vice or anything like that. So I really appreciate you sticking through this one. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll go ahead and catch you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.